Thank you for being uh, here in our course in, uh, on the doctrine of Christology. This is class number two, if you remember that. Uh, it's a delight to have, by the way, this is not a problematic stranger who wandered into our building. This is my son, our son, uh, Josiah, who lives in Denver, Colorado, and um, he has joined with us for the week. It's good to have you, Josiah, and Joel as well. So, um, Two weeks ago, we began this course on Christology, on the person and saving work of Christ, or the, the, the significance of Christ's life and work. And, uh, and I think it's really important that we have a good biblical understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus came to. To do. In class number one, we talked about pre incarnation and incarnation, uh, and we saw that uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is the eternal Son of God as um, in the Trinity, and took incarnate form uh, to, to be our Savior and our Lord. Tonight, we're looking at the subtitle of Jesus Christ as Savior. So we'll be looking at that theme this evening as we think together about Christ. Before we begin, I'd like to pray. Would you join me as we ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together? <clears throat> well, Heavenly Father, we want to know Christ, for in Him we have all that we need. And in knowing Christ, we want to know Christ as you've presented Him to be in the Word. And so we pray tonight that you would grant us mercy to understand Jesus as Savior. So we pray your blessing upon the teaching and the hearing of the truth this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus Christ as Savior sounds like a pretty obvious theme, but it does raise some specific questions. Uh, saved from what? Saved for what? And who benefits from his saving work? There's no question that the heart of Christology is redemption. Redemption in, in Christ. Redemption is the core of the scripture itself. If we could boil down the entire Bible, it will be under the heading of Jesus Christ in his saving work. That's the core and center of of the Bible in its, in its teaching. So tonight we want to talk about that. <clears throat> of course this presupposes that we understand Jesus in his saving work that's linked to the incarnation. That is to say, he came to this world in incarnate form to accomplish salvation and having accomplished it to thus be our Savior. So I want to begin by looking at scriptures. I hope you brought your Bibles with you if you didn't. Uh, I'll read these passages and you can notate them and jot them down. <clears throat> and these are representative passages that speak to the specific topic of Jesus as Savior. And I want to begin by Matthew chapter 1. You will readily recognize that this is in the narrative <clears throat> of Jesus' uh, foreshadowing and birth. Uh, this particular passage comes uh, from uh, the, the scripture that tells us about Joseph having a dream and the Lord sending an angel to Joseph, appearing to Joseph in a dream, assuring him that all is well and that he should follow through on taking Mary as his wife for the baby in her womb is indeed a very special child. <clears throat> 
In verse 21 of chapter 1, Matthew 1, 21, the angel says the following to Joseph in the dream. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so here we have a direct connection between the name Jesus, which denotes salvation in and of itself, and the saving work of Christ and his purpose of salvation and his birth. He will save his people from their sins. So all of Christ's life is really uh, centered around his saving work. In Luke chapter 19, the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, Jesus Christ himself speaking, uh, <clears throat> says, The following, at the end of the Zacchaeus narrative, in which Zacchaeus has become a Christian, he has embraced Christ as the Messiah. And he calls, Jesus calls uh, Zacchaeus a son of Abraham in verse 9, which is a term meant to describe Zacchaeus as a believer in the covenant promise of God. Then verse 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man here is a title uh, that Jesus embraces, as indeed he does embrace oftentimes in the gospel accounts, describing himself both in his incarnation and in his messianic saving work, all of which is packed into that title, the Son of Man. The Son of Man has come to seek And to save that which was lost. So Jesus describes his life, his whole purpose, as seeking the lost and saving the lost. In 1 John chapter 3, and these are passages that I've chosen that seem to me to be very clear in terms of their description of why uh, Jesus came uh, and, and this purpose of coming being housed into his saving work. And this is described in 1 John 3 and verse 8 in the following way. The one who practices sin is of the devil. And of course, the idea of practicing sin here is not just uh, sin committed in a punctiliar fashion in a moment in time, but one who lives a life of sin. Thus, the NASB translates it, the one who practices sin is of the devil. Then the text continues, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Then the Bible says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God in human flesh, came to earth, was born in human history in order to fulfill his purpose of destroying the works of the devil. And of course, that's another way of saying Christ saves. He destroys the work of the devil. And we could play that all the way through. There's a, all kinds of ways that we can describe that. He destroys the work of the devil when he delivers people from their sins. He destroys the work of the devil when he delivers them from condemnation and the wrath of God and saves them and brings them to a right relationship to God and justifies uh, sinners in God's sight and, and delivers believers from the power of sin and certainly delivering them from even hell itself. All of that is housed and much more in the idea of destroying the work of the devil. One of my favorite passages on this topic this evening is from the book of Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> this is one of the passages to which we turn to make the, the exclusive claim of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to God except through Christ. There is no other uh, way to be saved except through Jesus Christ. And this is a classic passage of scripture that describes that in very clear terms. In Acts 4.12 Uh, It says, and there is salvation in no one 
else. So the idea here is salvation. Uh, how is it to be achieved or how is that to be accessed? There is salvation in no one else. Acts 4.12 continues. And there is no other name under heaven uh, that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And if you bump back up to verse 10, uh, the, the, this whole uh, verse is found in that narrative where uh, this, uh, this person has been uh, healed. And uh, Peter uh, explains that he has been healed. This sick man, verse 9, has been made well, verse 10, uh, that all of you and all of Israel might know that it's by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene who was crucified that this person has, has been uh, well made well in front of you. It's this name that's referred to in verse 12. There is no other name but the name of Jesus uh, that's been given that we might, by which we might be saved. So this whole idea of the name of Christ and linked with his saving work is certainly in view. Another favorite passage is found in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I'm sure you enjoy uh, Luke's uh, nativity narrative. I think it's probably one of our favorites, probably the most favorite of all, where Luke describes the shepherds and the angels appearing to the shepherds. And these angels appearing to the shepherd uh, describe to the shepherds uh, that they have bring, they're bringing good news of great joy. Uh, verse 11, For today, the angel says, In the city of David, which he means Bethlehem, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So when the angels describe uh, who Jesus is, who's been born right over there in Bethlehem, the angel said he's a Savior. He is the Lord, but he is a Savior. Look at 1 Timothy 1. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 uh, describes Jesus in his saving person and work as an intercessor. <clears throat> and a savior, a savior of, of sinners. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. And he will say in the second chapter, verse 5, that he is a mediator between God and man. So Jesus Christ came into the world according to to Paul's statement here, to save sinners. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. <clears throat> and this will be our last verse tonight. Just wanted to give you a feel uh, for the biblical context of understanding Jesus Christ as a Savior. Uh, he is talking here about Jesus in His exclusiveness being the only Savior uh, to whom sinners can repair. 1 John 4, 14. We have seen and testify, writes John, that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, it's very interesting. If you'll study uh, systematic theologies, many systematic theologies have no separate category for Jesus as Savior. Uh, however, to be fair, uh, they would include this understanding of Jesus' person and his work in their discussion of his incarnation in uh, the doctrine of soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. But oftentimes they would not set it aside as a separate division of, of study. But I have chosen to set it apart for our study in Christology to think together tonight on this idea of Jesus Christ as Savior. I don't think we can conceive of who Jesus is separate from His being the Savior of God's people. So I want to 
pose the question that will help us launch into this. What is the nature of Jesus' saving work? For whom did he do this saving work and how is this saving work accessed by, by people? Well, that includes a number of ideas. Uh, Jesus Christ, in his saving work as Savior, establishes a saving relationship between God's people to God the Father. We know that uh, to be true. In fact, we've read that in the scriptures here. His saving work deals with the problem of sin, providing justification for believers before God. His saving work includes what I'll call the reorientation of reality and human history experienced and fulfilled in the eschatos or his second coming and what he accomplishes in his second coming. His saving work uh, transforms human lives and establishes not only a correction and a healing of the brokenness in human uh, life experience, but also establishes a love relationship between people. Thus, it is in that sense that we would argue that Jesus uh, is in, indeed a savior of corporate life experience or communal life experience as people are brought to a saving knowledge of, of God through faith in him and are transformed by his saving grace. This changes how they view each other and how they relate to each other. That, thus, that might be a second tier of his saving work. His saving work provides joy and fulfillment for the human soul and gives hope for the future. So all of these various aspects of Christ's saving impact in a human life, I think we can, can say is a rather comprehensive saving thing. I want to be careful to say that his saving engagement of the sinner, those who would believe in him, isn't always related in a present tense fashion. There are things that the Bible talks about related to Christ saving sinners that relates to our past or our past experience of faith, to our present as we look to him in faith today and in the days to come, and also in the life experience at the end of time and in eternity. There are different slices of his saving work that fits into these categorical perspectives. However, I do want to add that Jesus as Savior includes all of his entire earthly life experience and work. And sometimes we miss that. We think of Jesus only in his saving work on the cross. Certainly we need to know that. That's a vital piece of this saving work. But I think that we need to understand that Jesus lived a saving life in every experience and everything that he did. So that helps us to think about a number of things. First, Jesus is Savior in that he accomplished in his active and perfect obedience to the moral law in his earthly life experience. Thus, he was achieving righteousness or earned righteousness, achieving legal and moral perfection under the law in order that he might be a substitutionary vicarious sacrifice. In other words, if Jesus Christ wasn't morally perfect in all of his active obedience under the law, then the cross means nothing because he could not have been the perfect sacrifice to die for us. He could not achieve propitiation, nor could he appease divine wrath, uh, both of which uh, is infinite in nature. But because he did accomplish perfect righteousness under the law, he is saving believers by achieving our righteousness that he would give to us as a gift. We are thus justified and accepted before God because the perfect Savior died for us. Forgiveness of sins is offered to us. Cleansing of our soul, security of our salvation, and the certainty of our hope for glory after death. All of this is certified and validated because Jesus Christ, as our Savior, achieved perfection under, 
under the law. And then, of course, the imputation of his righteousness given to us as a gift. So let me give you several categories of salvation uh, that form our understanding of Jesus Christ as Savior. These would be categories of salvation that relate to Jesus as Savior. First, let's think together about Jesus as the saving Messiah. Jesus is the saving Messiah. And as the saving Messiah, we, we look at back at the Old Testament and its messianic promise that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ's person and his saving work. I want to just make a marginal note here to say, I really do not believe that we can adequately understand and appreciate Jesus Christ himself and his saving work if we don't rightly relate to the Old Testament. The Old Testament helps us. So you can't cut off the Old Testament in your Bible and throw it away um, and be done with it. The Old Testament actually is the backdrop uh, to help us understand who Jesus is in his, in his saving work uh, as the New Testament Savior. We understand that in a number of ways. For example, God's redemptive plan. God's redemptive plan begins in the Old Testament. God promised to save his people. We call it, call it a covenantal redemption. God formed a covenant that he took with himself and with his people and with his son, actually, uh, the son of God, to save his people through the son of God in incarnate flesh. And he chose a people before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. These people are, are included in this covenantal redemptive plan. And this covenantal <clears throat> redemptive plan is completed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ and in his saving work in the incarnation. It is through Christ that God will accomplish his defeating of evil and establish his kingdom in human experience on, on earth. All of these Old Testament ideas, and by the way, another marginal note, that is why, if you're astute enough, you will understand that I am not a dispensationalist because dispensationalism, now we do see dispensations uh, in the Old Testament, but we do, not, we do not believe in dispensationalism, which requires us to believe that God's saving people or his covenant people well, is always national Israel, which we do not subscribe to. But we believe that that is fulfilled in those who believe in Jesus Christ, including both Jew and Greek and Gentile uh, who come to believe in Jesus Christ. Thus, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth as the Savior, fulfilled the messianic promise to fulfill the covenant of redemption. Two, Jesus as Savior becomes thus our focus, uh, where we focus our believing faith. He becomes the focus of our believing faith. Uh, as you might know, if you've read the New Testament or studied it for any length of time, we are called to believe. We're called to trust. We're called to put our faith in God's saving work. But always that faith is targeted toward Jesus Christ in the New Testament and his saving work. Thus, as Savior, he becomes the focus of of our believing faith. When we put our faith in Christ as Savior, we are truly believing what God has said He would do for those who look to Christ in faith. But the focus is on Christ. Number three, Jesus' suffering as Savior is seen in the sacrifice on the cross. Now this, this concept, His suffering as Savior uh, in the cross and His sacrifice on the cross was absolutely lost on the disciples. They had no uh, means by which to understand how the Messiah could come and deliver them, yea, save them, and do so by dying. How does a Messiah win victories? By dying. 
And yet the New Testament uh, describes Jesus' saving work as being in his suffering on the cross, as a sacrifice on the cross. We know that the New Testament says that it is there where as a sacrifice for those who would believe in him, he endured the wrath of God because of imputational sin. That is to say, God took our sin, the guilt of our sin, and put that guilt on Jesus. He did not sin, but he was treated as if he had committed your sin and mine. And he was punished for our sin. That's called imputational sin. And there on the cross, he shed his blood as an atoning sacrifice for those who would believe in him. Thus, as our Savior on the cross, he is our sacrificial propitiation. And he satisfies the law and he appeases the wrath of God that we might be forgiven and set free. Thus, in that sense, he is our Savior through the suffering on the cross. For, as we saw uh, earlier, I commented on earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, Jesus also is a Savior uh, by being our mediator. And I just really want to revisit that momentarily in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. He, Paul writes, there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And by the way, this is a wonderful verse to, to comment on the idea that, that Jesus as Savior is directly linked to his incarnational nature. He could not save in his pre-incarnational experience. He had to come here in human flesh to be our Savior. Paul writes here, there's only one God. Okay, we believe that. And there's only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is not arguing that Jesus wasn't God. What he's arguing here is that Jesus' mediation, his intercessory work, is, rests upon the fact that Jesus was man. He took upon himself human uh, flesh, humanity, that he might bring God and man together. That's what he is saying here. Thus, Jesus as Savior in the incarnate flesh becomes our Savior in terms of mediating our relationship uh, with God. In 1 John chapter 2, uh, just briefly, verses 1 and 2, chapter 2, I really, I really love this uh, passage of Scripture uh, because it is a clear passage on the intercessory work of Christ. And uh, John writes in 1 John 2, verse 1 and verse 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, <laughs> I just think that's so great. John says, I hope you don't sin. You ought not to sin, but when you do sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate. With the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, or the righteous one. That is to say, uh, not only is he man, but he's a righteous man. He's the righteous intercessor. And thus his righteousness uh, intercedes for us. Verse 2, and Jesus, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. The only way for the world's sins to be propitiated, that is, to be forgiven, to be reckoned, uh, paid for, is by Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. Thus, He is our mediator. It is through Him that we come to God. Number five, Jesus as Savior is also, as Savior, the guarantee of salvation. And by the way, this is hallelujah ground. Hallelujah ground. Jesus uh, is the Savior of those who would believe in Him to the degree that our salvation is guaranteed in Him. 
Now, his cross and his rising from the dead are in tandem here. He did the hard work of saving us on the cross by paying for our sins, by appeasing the wrath of God, by, by establishing the foundation for our justification, by establishing our righteousness that was applied or credited to us. But all of this saving work which was done at the cross, was certified in the resurrection. Meaning what? Meaning if Jesus had not come back from the dead, that saving work could not have been considered accomplished. However, when Jesus rose from the dead, it meant his saving work was accepted by the Father. And that is a guarantee for us that because he rose from the dead, we are forgiven. We are saved. And that's why we celebrate uh, that resurrection day each year in the spring. Number six, Jesus as Savior is also seen in the scripture uh, in his being crucified and risen together. But we'll, we'll just skip that because uh, I've already kind of talked about that in the guarantee and the mediation. Jesus certainly is Savior in and the crucified one and the one who was raised from the dead. Seven, Jesus is thus as Savior in the cross and rising from the dead, exalted to the highest place, given a name above every name, and is declared to be the Lord of all in authority and the one who gives life to those who believe in him. That's what lordship means. It means he's the victor. It means he's the one who has all authority. It means that he is the one who sovereignly gives life to those who come to him. Now this includes his uh, operation in, in Pentecost in the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now you'll look in the gospel accounts, particularly in the gospel of, of John, and Jesus at times will speak of the coming of the Holy Spirit as it relates, as he relates to the Father. Thus he will say, the Father will send uh, the Spirit. And other times Jesus will say, uh, the Holy Spirit will come because I, Jesus, will send him. Thus we, we, we say it, we, we talk about the coming of the Spirit as emanating from both Father and the Son. The Father and the Son sends Christ. But relating to Jesus sending the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to represent Christ and His life in us. Every person who comes to Christ, every person who is transformed by God's saving grace is reborn, is regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, which includes receiving the life of of Jesus Christ. So we speak of Jesus being in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit brings the life of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit resides in us, and indeed the life of Christ resides in us as well. Thus Jesus is a life-giving Savior through the Holy Spirit. And all that Jesus does in us and to us and for us in the Spirit is part of his saving work. And, and let me make this point that thus I think we should see Jesus as our Savior, not in a punctiliar fashion, as if to say, he did this one thing one time in my life, for which I'm deeply grateful. But he not only did that, but he resides in me every second I live. And he delivers me from my sin every day that I live. That's called sanctification. And that is part of our salvation as well. And Jesus is doing that saving work through the Holy Spirit in us. I, by the way, I think that's exciting to think of Jesus being with us in the Holy Spirit, saving me. Tomorrow, I don't know what's going to happen to you, but I know Jesus will be saving you tomorrow through the Holy Spirit. Number eight, 
Uh, Jesus is the head of the church. Uh, I've already raised the issue of the corporate expression of Jesus' saving work, and I want to return to that at this point to say this. Uh, the church is a part of God's saving work in the world. I don't think we should think about the church as separate from God's saving work. The church was born at Pentecost in God's saving expression of sending the Holy Spirit, bringing the life of Christ, uh, being experienced in individuals, certainly, but these individuals who were saved at Pentecost uh, ended up engaging together in a church relationship experience as, as an extension of God's saving grace. Thus, the church is born out of salvation in the salvation of, of, of God's people. Now, this is part of the argument that we would make to argue for the necessity of the church. I know this is not a class on ecclesiology, but let me just make this point. Uh, as we, I think it was G. Campbell Morgan who made this statement. I think it's a good statement. He said, I do not believe in a Christless churchianity, nor do I believe in a churchless Christianity. So what he's saying here is church must have Christ at his, as its center. But if you have Christ in his saving operation in the life of the Spirit in human history, there will by necessity be a corporate expression of that. That's what the church is. It is Jesus' life in his people bringing us together. And I could go off down that road and talk about the importance of the church. And you see where I could do that. And we often talk about the importance of, of, of the church. The church is God's people. And Christ is the head of his people. Uh, Paul talks about the church as his body. And Christ as the head. That's why we do not believe the New Testament teaches that no human person is the head of the church. We do not believe in a pope. Because Christ is the head. And nor does he choose a vicar to rule in his stead. But Christ himself is head of the church in the language of the Apostle Paul. And the church is his bride. The church is his body. The church is his gifted expression in and through the world. This is also part of Jesus' saving work in the world. One other uh, point here. This would be in my list, number nine. I don't know if it's, it's, uh, you, your list is the same or not. But in my list, Jesus says, Savior is a Savior taught in the New Testament as Savior, as a coming champion. A coming champion. It is not true to say all of the hope that we are given in the New Testament as it relates to Jesus' saving work is all past tense. That is not true to say that. The New Testament clearly, I would, I would argue this point, and some may wish to argue it with me, and we'd have a wonderful time doing that. But the New Testament indicates that there is a promise in the gospel that is yet to be fulfilled that will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes back. He comes back to finish what he has begun. He will finish his work in the kingdom. Uh, all of evil will be banished. All of salvation will be accomplished. That is, implemented and applied. Our bodies will be resurrected from the dead. And all the molecular structure of the universe will be reconstituted and everything will be changed. That's a part of his saving work as well. So let me suggest to you uh, certain essential and necessary aspects of these things as taught in the New Testament regarding Jesus as the Savior. I want to press the point that all through this teaching, everything we've been talking about, there has been a thread. And that thread is Jesus is the only Savior. Or we call Him the exclusive 
Savior. There is no other Savior but Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus and someone else. It's not someone else substituting for Jesus. It's Jesus Christ alone. He and He alone is the Savior of sinners. He and He alone is the hope of the world. The New Testament is clear about that. Let me add to that, that Jesus Christ as Savior by necessity involves both His own obedience to the law and His sacrifice on the cross. That in, the, in this sense of the word, that's why Paul says, I preach Christ crucified. If he could summarize his preaching of the gospel, it is of Christ in his righteous obedience, going to the cross and suffering and dying for us. Third, all through these gospel teachings about Christ as Savior, there is without question a teaching about hope being offered to the world, to sinners, through Jesus Christ in His saving work. One of my concerns in these days is that the church, in, in, in retaining the gospel of Jesus Christ in our own generation, must also retain the joy that we have in the gospel and the hope we can offer sinners through the gospel. We are not a cancellation organization. Yes, we preach against sin. And yet we offer to sinners the joyful hope of forgiveness of sin and new life in Jesus Christ. This hope is the assurance that we have that God's wrath does not have to be faced. Hell can be avoided. Our sins can be forgiven. We can be justified before God with whom we have to do. We can be transformed in life and the devil is defeated and we can have the victory. <clears throat> so, let's summarize. Let's summarize these teachings. <clears throat> and if you'll note, <clears throat> I, I am doing um, uh, what the educators call a re recapitulation. <clears throat> I am circling around and picking up on these themes as we move forward. Cycling back as we move forward. Because it's really important that we have a reiteration of these ideas, not only to help us remember them, but also to help us have a full explanation and understanding of what it means for Jesus to be Savior. Thus, the summary of the Bible's teaching concerning Jesus as our Savior. Number one, Jesus is the saving sacrifice for sin. By the way, that, that is at the heart of salvation. That sin must be dealt with. Not just canceled out. It must be paid for in full. Jesus assumes the responsibility for our sin, for our guilt, for our punishment. Jesus assumes the duty to fulfill justice by dying for us. That we might be forgiven that we might be cleansed from guilt, that we might be righteous in God's sight, and that God would accept us. Two, Jesus as the Savior thus becomes the object of our saving faith for those of us who believe in Him. We look to Christ in what He has done for us that we might be saved. Three, Jesus as Savior becomes the Lord of life <clears throat> and the giver of eternal life to those who will look to Him. And John, when we get into the gospel of John, I trust that I'll live long enough to preach through John, at least get into it. Um, you'll see this idea repeated all the way through the gospel. He who believes in Jesus, he who believes in Jesus. It's believing in Christ that, that gives us access through faith in him uh, to the life that only Jesus Christ can offer. Number four, Jesus as Savior transforms lives lives granting regeneration and sanctification five jesus is the deliverer from evil by the way let's keep preaching that god can set you free from your sin through jesus christ our lord isn't that a wonderful thing to preach amen number six jesus 
also saves His people and shepherds us by providentially watching over us. I tried to reiterate that earlier in terms of His presence in the Holy Spirit, but I want to uh, just shade it a little bit here in the standpoint of His shepherding providence. I believe Jesus is right at the present time and throughout my life and yours, shepherding us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He keeps us. He protects us. He provides for us. And one day He will come for us. Seven. Jesus is, as our Savior, the teacher. He teaches us through the Word of God, the Bible, and through the Holy Spirit's illumination of the Scripture. He saves us through His teaching, dispelling ignorance. I don't know whether you've ever connected in your mind the idea of salvation and learning but actually learning is a saving exercise we are delivered from darkness the darkness of ignorance and false thinking number eight jesus the savior saves us also by preparing for us a heavenly home and he will save us by taking us to heaven i i have done much uh, preaching from and thinking about the 14th chapter of John, in which Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is preparing a place for us in heaven right now. And he will come to take us unto himself. I've said this several times. I'll say it again here, <clears throat> I think there are two ways that that passage can be applied in our life experience. <clears throat> Number one, <clears throat> what is commonly considered uh, the second coming of Christ, I think that is absolutely certain that Jesus Christ is coming to save His people when He comes the second time. <clears throat> I believe the Bible says that there will be people on earth there, there will be people that are believers on earth when Jesus Christ comes back. <clears throat> and when he comes back, <clears throat> he will uh, save us if you're here. And we might be here. We may be the terminal generation. <clears throat> uh, but that's a hope that we have if we are here. But I also think there's another way that this, can, this promise that he gives can be applied. Uh, I have on occasion seen believers die. And I always felt like I was on holy ground. Uh, that God was doing something in the room that was beyond the scope of my capacity to understand. Dare I say that Jesus came and took his loved one home. It's a holy place and a holy moment. I think Jesus fulfills that promise by being with us in our final moments and transferring us to heaven, to the place that he has prepared for us. All of these things are his saving work. Every aspect of this. <clears throat> Thus, I could also summarize categorically the saving work of Jesus in three categories. <clears throat> uh, he's a savior of what people he's a savior from what problem and he's a savior for what promise first the savior of who is the people what people does he save he's the savior of those people whom who look to him in faith believing they are the elect God chose us from the foundation of the world. They are believers. They have faith in Christ. They are Jesus' disciples. They are followers of the Lord Jesus. He is the Savior of these people. And when the Bible speaks of Him being the Savior of the world, it means that Jesus Christ is capable of saving every individual all over the world. And He is the exclusive Savior of the world in that there is no other Savior except Jesus Christ for this world. However, in terms of implementation of His saving work, this is applied only for the elect who believe and follow in Christ. 
Second, he's the Savior from. What does he save us from? He saves us from sin. By the way, I, I sometimes sense people want to come to Jesus and they do not want him to save them from their sin. They want to keep their sin. But you cannot have salvation without being delivered from your sin. He saves you from the grip and the bondage of your sin. Not just deeds of sin, but your sinfulness. He set your heart free to live a new life in Him. He saves us from divine judgment. I dare say, perhaps we don't understand this, but the greatest danger the sinner is in is the danger the sinner is in from God Himself. Can you imagine a sinner facing God as judge? Jesus said, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but fear Him who can cast both body and soul in hell. Thus, thirdly, He saves us from hell. Thanks be to God. And He delivers us from evil. And evil can be described in three different ways. Uh, we can talk about evil as personified in the devil. We can talk about evil as identified as a fallen world system. And we can talk about evil as it relates to our own fleshly sinfulness. <clears throat> but nonetheless, Jesus Christ saves from all of this evil. From the devil, from the world, and from our own sinfulness. Thanks be to God. And what does He save us for? He saves us for many wonderful things. He not only saves us from these things, but He saves us for holiness and sanctification, for a new life and a justified state, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the cleansing of our souls, the cleansing of our consciences. Hebrews makes much of the fact that our conscience is cleansed through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I think this offers great hope for those who are burdened of soul and who are disturbed of heart. He saves us for service and He saves us for heaven. Jesus is our Savior in all of these ways. Thus, we love to sing. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. One has said, had I a 10,000 gifts beside, I'd cleave to Jesus crucified and build on him alone for no foundation is there given on which to place my hopes of heaven but Christ the cornerstone. John Newton said at age 82, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. One, I am a great sinner and Christ is a greater Savior. So I think, I think we just need to understand that the, the baby in Bethlehem and, and the, the Lord Jesus Christ who taught the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord on the cross who rose from the dead, who ascended back on high, all that we know about Him and all that is taught about Him comes down to one thing. He is the Savior. And we'll pick up with Christology and, and carry this on in class three, if the Lord wills, next week. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We extol him, exalt him, promote him, praise him, look to him in faith. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you might continue to do the work of salvation in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. For those of us who have been converted, regenerated, we thank you tonight that you have done that great saving work through grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit. But we pray you'll continue the saving work and sanctification, which includes growing in holiness, but also in comfort and peace of heart. And we pray you'll continue it until the day of Christ Jesus, wherein we will experience 
that magnificent glorification that you've promised where every sin will pass away, every tear will be wiped dry, and we will be all that you've saved us to be. We thank you for Christ. Thank you for sending him to be our Savior. Thank you for drawing us to him as our Savior. We pray that you'll help us to recommend him, testify of him, and to proclaim him to others as the Savior of sinners. Thank you for this great truth and for being with us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.